I don't believe in the notion of authenticity in food. I don't believe that authenticity is a useful tool to judge the quality of food. I don't believe that any dish or meal which better reflects its origins is more pleasurable than one that does not. I don't believe that the function of a restaurant is to represent a culinary identity. I don't believe that any restaurant anywhere in the world serves authentic food. I believe that food should be tasty, pleasurable, nutritious, and as far as possible healthy. Now this is not a commonly held position. In fact, it goes against the very grain of how we think about food, how we talk about it, how we describe it to others. So when I was the editor of a food magazine and some websites, I expressly forbade my team of writers, my contributors from co and columnists from using the word. Unfortunately, most uh, chefs, restauranters, uh, food critics, and ordinary people continue to use it to, uh, to describe regional and local food. Now this creates a problem. So a few years ago, there was a spate of articles on Indian food that uh, weren't originally from India. So as you can tell from the, the tone of the headlines, it seemed like some lurid scandal had been uncovered. And they went on to say, uh, from dal chawal to rajma, from uh, samosas to gulab jamuns, jalebis to tea, these are Indian foods that have tricked you all your life. Now obviously uh, these articles struck a chord because they went viral and they were widely disseminated on India's most trusted news application. What's that? <laughs> So what was so scandalous? Quite simply, uh, dishes that we thought were our very own weren't actually. We believed they were Indian. We grew up believing they were Indian. And suddenly we were told that, hey, these aren't indigenous sons and daughters of the soil. They aren't purely Indian. They aren't truly Indian. They aren't authentically Indian. They aren't authentic. So what do we mean when we say authentic and authenticity? I think uh, a good place to start would be uh, the dictionary definition. And uh, it says, of undisputed origin, not a copy, genuine, uh, an authentic depiction of the situation. And the one that interests us actually is uh, made or done in the traditional or original way, or in a way that faithfully resembles an original. But I discovered this was not always the meaning of the word. Uh, when I looked up my uh, father's copy of the Chambers Dictionary published in 1969, I found that there was no reference to anything made in the traditional or original way. This is a meaning that has come from communalus, though I would allege from misuse. However, let's look at this dictionary's definition and see whether it actually holds up to scrutiny. So, implicit in the meaning of the word original is that something has determinable geographical origins and it has an identity based on those origins. So, Indian food comes from India, Chinese food comes from China. Let's for a moment keep aside uh, political boundaries and political histories, in which case geography is immutable. Discounting the fact that India has been pushing into the Asian plate at about 5 centimeters a year, I think it's fairly safe to say that India is exactly where it was 30 million years ago. And this is true for every country all around the world. Now, I'm going to be referencing India a lot in this talk, uh, but that's only so that uh, you guys can relate to the examples I'm giving. The arguments, however, hold for every country and every cuisine all around the world. So coming to identity, identity is a very thorny and contentious issue, but it lies at the very heart of the question of authenticity. In fact, the whole premise of authenticity is based on whether the food reflects that promised identity or not, which is why people were upset about the gulab jamuns and so on. We thought they were our own. 
So at its uh, very basic, identity separates us from them, but when we actually try to get down and look at those definitions, they don't seem to be rock solid. We're actually standing on a ground that's as wobbly and jiggly as a jelly. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you to use identity as a metric for authenticity. When do you suppose that you were the most authentic? Was it when you were born? When you had your first memories? When you went to school? When you graduated from college? When you got married? These are all you, but they are not the same person. Perhaps the only time that you are truly authentic is when you are on stage giving a TED talk. <laughs> Catch me once I'm off stage and I'll let you know. <laughs> when moving from the individual to the family, it's not a very strong unit of identity. But one step up at the community, when things get more codified, there is a sense of uniformity. And this is mirrored at the regional level in Europe. So community in India, region in Europe, about the same. But in India, if you're looking at regional and national identities, that poses more of a challenge. Because as much as we'd like to, we can't reduce it to a finite set of markers. There are many kinds of Marshals, many kinds of Tamilians, and even more kinds of Indians. So let's look at food then. I think we can safely dismiss the notion of a national cuisine because all cuisines are made of multiple cuisines. You can talk of foods of India or foods from India, but not really of Indian food. But generally when we are speaking of a national cuisine, what we are talking about is a collection of regional dishes that have transcended their place of origin and are now identified with the country as a whole. However, in my opinion, this Indian restaurant or this North Indian Punjabi Mughlai has very tenuous and dubious connections. At the community level, uh, we face a bit of a quandary. Now, the body of the cuisine is smaller. There are more rules and restrictions. There are more taboos. So there is a greater shared understanding of what the various components of a dish are. Uh, let's take, for instance, uh, the Pasi Dansa. We know that it will contain a combination of dal, spices, it will have mutton, chicken, or be meatless, and everything will be cooked till it has a certain color and texture. So, does that mean that at the level of community we can talk of authenticity? To a certain extent, yes, but not entirely, because while there is a shared understanding, there isn't absolute compliance. Uh, if we had to argue that there is only one way to make a dansa, then whose dansa would we use to judge all the others by? Would be the dansa prepared by Parsi caterers, by Parsi restaurateurs, by Parsi families? So I said the family is not a strong unit of identity, but because it's made up of members who have very clear preferences, clear likes and dislikes, it is a unit that has a very distinct culinary identity. That is why I don't believe that Mrs. Irani and Mrs. Pesunji are going to cook their dansa exactly the way that Mrs. Bilomonia does it. Nor do I believe that uh, Mrs. Pinto or Mrs. Fernandez are going to change the recipe for Vindalu just so that it matches the way that Mrs. Rodriguez does it. Now, we can all say with certainty that the current way that we cook is not pure. We are living in a modern, globalized world. Palettes have changed, ingredients have changed, techniques have uh, changed. So what should we do? Should we go back to Mrs. Bill, Bill Moria's grandmother's way of cooking? I suggest we go back even further. Go back to the turn of the previous century, when things were far more rigid. When strict social boundaries were maintained, men might uh, go out to war together, they might work together, but they would not eat together. And this was as true in Europe as it was in Asia and India. The boundaries were so strict that in 1825, the 
French Gastelum and Epicure Jean Antoine La Savarin could boldly say, Tell me what you eat, and I will tell you who you are. But something happened 250 years ago that disrupted things in the coming centuries and whose effects we arguably feel even today. The Industrial Revolution severely damaged historical social patterns and identities. It forced people of disparate origins, classes, and ultimately genders to work together. Urbanization forced them to live together. Modernization re resulted in a series of upward progressive movements. But there was a downside as well. We started using the principles of mass production to cooking. We believed that if you had an original formulation and original design, then any factory anywhere in the world could reproduce hundreds, thousands of fundamentally indistinguishable products. And if you had that original specification, then you could put anything in front of you, whether it was a Prada bag or a masala dosa, and decide if it was authentic or fake. And we could do this because we believed in cooking we had an original formulation. After all, what is a recipe but a standardized format for communicating culinary instructions. Now, if you want to get a recipe for uh, spaghetti bolognese or shukto or chicken tikka masala, uh, you will go online and look for it. If you're old school, you will look at a cookery book. But recipe books are a fairly modern phenomenon. The first uh, modern recipe uh, book, Modern Cookery for Families by Lisa Acton, was published only in 1845, when England was first beginning to feel the effects of the Industrial Revolution. It was not a book for professional chefs or cooks, it was a book for individuals, and it set the format for modern cookery writing. So you had uh, measured ingredients followed by detailed instructions. But cooking is a very tactile process. You need to see, you need to smell, you need to taste, and you even need to hear when you're cooking. So as a writer, as a cook, as an occasional instructor, I can assure you that recipes are at best a roadmap to your destination. To actually get there and to get there correctly, you need a guide. And that is why professional chefs do something called starters. Short periods of unpaid apprenticeships where they work in the kitchens of professional, of internationally renowned chefs. That is why you still have cooking classes. That's why cooking videos on YouTube and Instagram proliferate. That is why you can also never recreate an ancient recipe. You don't have a living guide to show you the way. So recipes are a useful uh, resource but not a reliable tool. Uh, individuals and families cook to their own beat. Regional and national cuisines are a bit of an uh, illusion. At the level of community, there is a degree of authenticity as long as they stick to the same ingredients, the same techniques, the same equipment, and the food stays within the community itself. Food does not travel well. If it moves outside the community, when Mr. Ayer in invites Mr. Biswas over for a meal, the food changes. And when it moves outside the region, it changes even more. And this is where the restaurant comes in. So restaurants started up with, to cater to migrant workers. Initially, they catered to people from the same village, the same caste. But as the city grew, as new people started, uh, people from outside started eating at the restaurant, the food changed. The owners tried to control it by bringing down chefs, ingredients, equipment. But there was one change that they couldn't change. And that was their customer. So you, and to a certain extent me, are the reason why you can never have an authentic meal at a restaurant. Because all of us, all over the world, have very definite and set palates. Now this doesn't mean that we can't learn to like things that we don't think of as tasty. 
but it does mean that we will always return to comforting and satisfying flavors. And that's why home cooked food always tastes the best. Palates vary from city to city, from region to region. They are linked to geography. And restaurateurs have learned to accept that. They have realized that if they are to if they are to survive, they have to adopt. Because restaurants are businesses. They are not museums. They are not there to protect culinary legacies. They are not there to protect culinary identities. They are there to make money. And they make money only when customers return repeatedly. That is why the sambar in Bombay is sweet and not spicy. That is why there are as many versions of Chinese food as there are countries in the world. <laughs> and the same thing is going to happen to India when the food gets popular. I don't have a problem with it. As far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, let a thousand Indian cuisines blossom. Each one will bring something new, something different, something interesting. I don't care where the gulab jamun or the jalebi came from. If it's tasty, I will eat it. <laughs> and no, I didn't share any one of those silly articles. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>